So here's a good question for you. How many times in your career have you been 50% above the stall speed, 30 degrees nose low in the stall? Military pilots would say, I've been there. Civilian training, likely not, unless you've had very specific, unique training that's out of the curriculum that you normally take as a pilot. So the advantage of that is, as it was said in the video, is that airspeed and flight attitude are no guarantee that you're not stalled. If you're getting the characteristics and indication of a stall, irrespective of your flight attitude, pitch or bank, or even the airspeed being presented, that you as the pilot need to reduce angle of attack. And from your reference frame in the cockpit, that is a push forward on the elevator. And I'll tell you right now, having trained so many pilots, when you're 30 degrees nose low, that is really hard for them to do. The ground is there, they just want to keep making the house smaller. So it's really no surprise in some of these accidents where that condition is presenting itself is that pilots' natural instincts are try to make the houses smaller or stay away from the ground. And unfortunately, because of the aerodynamics going on, that action won't solve the condition. We have to first regain and maintain control, and then we can minimize altitude loss. Okay? All right. So the stall, and I think this is a great diagram because what it shows is you can see that the wing is pointing about 45 degrees nose up, but where the wing is going okay, is below the horizon. All right? Try to remember that. The angle of attack of your airplane is the difference between where the wing is pointing and where it's going through the air. Very, very important. We can't get comfortable thinking that the relative airflow is always off the front of our nose. Okay. Now, if we're good at prevention, early intervention, and taking correct measures early, then that is true. But unfortunately, in these situations, in the stall, it is not. All right. Let's go ahead and take a look at a skidded turn stall. We are simulating now that we're in the traffic pattern. We may have, uh, we may be turning base to final, and we've got about 30 to 40 degrees uh, angle of bank, our maximum angle of bank we're willing to do. We look out, we see an overshoot, and rather than fixing it with angle of bank or going around, we inappropriately apply bottom rudder, uh, back stick, and right aileron to hold the angle of bank and hold the nose up. So we continue to overshoot is continue. We continue to feed rudder and back stick, rudder and back stick. And there's a stall. Push, power, rudder, roll, and climb. Pull it back to BY, attitude, checking uh, positive rates, recovery is complete. Now you heard the pilot talking in that recovery, okay? We call that a strategy or a recall technology. What it is is just a method of a pilot being able to take effective action in a crisis that they've been trained for. It's kind of out of the scope of our conversation here, but the most important part of that particular exposure is that they take a disciplined approach to diagnosing and solving the situation. And I know it's a familiar procedure to, to Pat as well. He's familiar with that one. It's, it's important for the pilot to have something to grab onto. And the reason why that matters so much is that their instincts are usually wrong. Diagnosing it is very, very difficult. So there has to be what's called a planned approach to recovery. So that's the stall. Now, the reason why that airplane stalled is because, and it rolled is because it's uncoordinated. You can have the exact same airplane stall and go to the high wing. In this particular case, because it was uncoordinated in the skid, the bottom wing stalled first, which made the situation much worse. And as I talked about earlier, there are ways of diagnosing that. The good news is, is for many pilots out there, in our training, we don't often differentiate between a slip and a skid. We simply call it a cross-controlled stall. Okay? The good news is that especially in small airplanes, sometimes even in big airplanes, although your passengers don't like it very much, is that you can actually slip an airplane. All right? As we get into bigger airplanes, all right, is that we use geometry and configuration to get down and slow down. But the little operators out there can still use a slip to allow the airplane, the relative airflow, okay, goes off the nose and they slip. And if they stall in a slip, the good news is, is that instead of going to a steeper bank angle like the skid, at least it's going to stall and go over the top to a more favorable flight attitude. The difference between these flight conditions is astronomical. The skid is energy depleting 
and prone to the stall spin. The slip is actually stall spin resistant, and when it does stall, it's more favorable. Now, do we ever want to go out and stall, let alone cross-controlled stall? No, we don't. The reason why this matters is because when these happen in the real world at all sizes of airplanes, it's unintentional, and the pilot very often doesn't even know that they're doing it. So in this particular scenario, in this particular uncoordinated stall, is since it's unintentional, very often the first thing that grabs the pilot's attention is an uncommanded roll. There may or may not be a warning to the pre-stall warning, depending on the measurement systems, whether it's a pitot tube, an AHARS, whatever is measuring the, the stall of the airplane. Okay, let's move on to a little bit of a different topic now. So I, I kind of like that my, totally by accident, that my actual video pictures up here look just like the model I'm holding. So let's pretend that it was planned, Rick. So here we go. All right, so no is low upsets. I do want to address a couple academic issues here because I'm on the topic of angle of attack. All right, so very often an airplane upset, this could technically be called a rolling upset. All right, a rolling upset. Certainly it's a bank attitude problem, okay? It really, really is. So when you ask pilots what the first thing you need to address is in a rolling upset, very often it's counter roll. I need to roll this airplane back upright. And that's very effective until you start passing a certain threshold of experience because what do 90% of pilots do when they get to this situation? They don't think about rolling, they think about pulling. And even though we know that is wrong, it's I gotta make the houses smaller and down they go. So, the angle of attack or the unload or the push step that we use in the stall to recover aerodynamically from it, in this particular case, if nothing else, we might want to start with the push before the rule just to make sure, number one, we aren't pulling. Okay? That's the advantage of having some type of a strategy. Now, ideally, we probably do want to unload the airplane. Okay? We don't, when we say unload, I want to make sure it's clear that we are not talking about angle of attack. When we say unload the airplane, we're talking about a half G. Right now, I'm under one G due to gravity. When I unload, I'm kind of light in my shoes, but it's not negative G. I'm not pushing myself out of the cockpit because in this particular situation, the unload, number one, helps us minimize that dive angle that we would do by pulling, all right? Also, by being unloaded, we actually have a better roll rate in the airplane by being at low angle of attack and also it's eliminating asymmetric loading. If a pilot, due to their instincts, is prone to be pulling and rolling, 